Thank you very much, Averal, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to uh, give this uh, talk at um, Embedded Systems Week. I'm going to um, present some of the work that my group and I have been uh, doing in incorporating machine learning into safety certificates in robotics. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the kind of um, formal methods and uh, formal methods applied to uh, uh, robotic platforms that have been um, developed and kind of grown up within the embedded systems community um, has been a real inspiration for thinking about how to uh, how to think about you know real time control with safety certificates, yet incorporate these um, uh, these uh, machine learning constructs that are largely coming from areas like uh, perception, unknown environments into the robotic systems. Oops. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, as I just said, one of the um, one of the biggest motivations for bringing and uh, I guess needs for bringing in machine learning into robotic systems is perception, and um, these are just two companies in the Bay Area, uh, which my students have been interning in over the past few years. The first is Skydio. It uh, produces. Basically, it's like a really high quality flying camera or set of cameras. Um, that uh, so a, a drone equipped with a number of cameras um, that is typically used in um, tracking people through sporting activities, for example. Um, so uh, you know, flying in environments where there are trees, you know, telephone wires, things like that. It has to avoid those. The second is Neuro, which is a delivery vehicle. Uh, it's delivering. Um, it, it's not, uh, you know, people are not inside that vehicle. It's solely for delivery. And um, again, it's driving on um, environments like our roadways where it has to perceive and interact um, at, safely with the environment. So I'm going to spend the first part of the talk kind of more on the embedded system side, thinking about um, a hybrid system model for the robotic system and how one designs safety certificates for that. And then um, we'll segue into talking about how to incorporate machine learning constructs into the um, uh, into well, machine learning methodologies into those safety constructs. And throughout, I'll illustrate through um, some of these examples, um, robotic examples in my lab. Okay, so the concept of a, a reachable set, this is a, um, a methodology a number of people in embedded systems in computer aided verification have been working on for a number of years now. And it's, um, it's a, basically a model checking method. Um, so the idea is that if you have a dynamic system uh, and that dynamic system can be described by a continuous state, continuous time model, which is the example that I'm illustrating here on the slide, where there's a differential equation model describing the system dynamics with state X, control input U, disturbance input D. Uh, but, but this could be um, a finite state machine. It could be a hybrid system representation. It's a, it's a system in which the state evolves according to some dynamics. Here it's this vector field F, and there's a possibility of having control inputs as well as inputs to the system that you can't control, which we're gonna lump into this disturbance vector. So the backwards reachable set of this, uh, say this red ellipse here, G at time zero, is all is the set of all states for which for all possible control inputs U, there's a disturbance input D, which could drive the system into that set, the, the ultimate set G at time zero in um, T time units. So we'll label that G at time T. Okay, so these pink states here in this uh, stylistic representation are those states for which there's a control such that, or, so there exists a disturbance such that for all possible control, the system could get into this region. So I pictured it as kind of an unsafe condition here. The control is trying to keep the system safe, the disturbance, we don't know what it's going to do. So we're going to assume that it 
could do its worst to drive the system to an unsafe condition. And then, you know, this red set represents unsafe conditions. So, so these states are states which could become unsafe despite the best possible action of the control. And in safety critical situations, that's often the construct that we'd like to um, uh, record those states which could become unsafe. We don't know if they will. You know, in this case, if the disturbance doesn't play its worst action, the system may stay safe. But but we don't know because we can't. We don't have a model of the disturbance except for possibly some bounds on the disturbance. Uh, so in in the kind of model checking community, my group and I have been developing this um, uh, this method for computing reachable sets by using optimal control and game theory. So we have these two players, a control and disturbance, and they're, they're playing against each other so that um, the, the, the players act in a way which um, always, you know, from the side of the control input, it's always doing its best to keep the system safe. So that means that, you know, practically, if the system state is in this blue region outside the pink region or red region, then there's always a control input which can keep the system safe for at least T time units. Um, and you don't really have to do anything if you're not on the boundary of the set. But if, if you're on the boundary of the set, the idea is to apply the optimal control which keeps the system safe, keeps it outside of that red region. And that's the importance of computing this control and disturbance. So, um, so we showed, uh, this was um, an early paper with, um, uh, with uh, Ian Mitchell uh, and Alex Bayan, so some of my first PhD students, um, that you can compute this backwards reachable set as the zero sub-level set of a function j of x t and that function J solves this, what's called a hamilton jacobi isaacs equation. It's a PDE which um, evolves. So this function J of X T um, evolves over space and time. And at each point in, at state space, at each point in time, if you record the sub-zero level sets of that function J, you're getting back exactly that backwards reachable set, the one that we had on the previous slide. And to solve it, um, one needs to solve this PDE through space and time. So it's, um, it's akin to a dynamic programming argument that um, we're describing on the, on the left-hand side, how that function is, just, is changing over time. On the right-hand side, we've got its change over space. So this is the gradient of J, the inner product between the uh, gradient of J and the dynamics of the system itself. And this max over u, min over d, that's actually the optimal control for the worst disturbance. This min with zero ensures that once a state has been labeled as safe, it cannot, as unsafe, it cannot go safe at a, at a future time. So it's, it's like we start on the boundary of the set and we basically solve this, uh, solve this PDE backwards from the boundary of the set over the whole state space, capturing that level set. Okay, so this, this, um, um, you know, statement is, uh, we, we worked on this for continuous and hybrid systems, but there had been, um, you know, a number of, uh, you know, similar works that have been done before. Dmitry Bertsekas had worked back in the uh, 1970s on formulating these reachable sets for discrete state systems. And then there's been kind of a lot of ensuing work. We did this early work with Shankar Sastri and John Ligeros, um, the, the actual statement of the hamilton jacobi isaacs this theorem and proof was done with Ian Mitchell and Alex Bayan. And there's been a number of researchers working on uh, formulations of this time, varying formulations, et cetera. So it's, um, it's, um, it's become kind of a, I, I would say a more classic problem in computing reach. And the idea, just as um, I pointed out, this is kind of looking stylistically, is that that set you, you don't you, you you don't write the set explicitly. You write it as implicitly through the sub-zero level sets of a function j of x t. So if we think about kind of a side view of this, um, so take a slice and look at a side view. We have a function j of x at time zero, and that zero sub-level set is just the original set g of zero we started with, and then that PDE in, evolves that function j over time so that we're always kind of capturing that zero sublevel set slice. 
Okay, so that's that's what's shown here. And that's, um, it's, it's nice in some ways. I mean, we still have to deal with computational complexity, but it's nice because you can represent um, non-convex sets. You can represent disconnected sets through this function. Um, it's just, we're always just capturing the zero, the zero sublevel set. And if the set, if, if you compute back and the set freezes after some time, freezes means it doesn't grow anymore. So we call that controlled invariant for all T. Then if you take any super zero level set, so if this function itself represents the zero sublevel set, any super zero level set is also controlled invariant. And you can use that for safety. Um, and then as you know more and more about the disturbance, um, so the unknown function, as you learn more about it, um, you can actually optimize this, right? The set becomes less conservative because you're not um, necessarily protect, protecting against all possible disturbances. So this is the code. We, I mean, this is the theorem, but we developed a, um, and we've been developing over time, a set of code to compute that reachable set. Um, so the very first code was done by Ian Mitchell, and that's this link here, the level set toolbox. This is, uh, Ian is now a professor in uh, computer science at uh, University of British Columbia. And uh, this is a link to that level set toolbox. And then over time, um, our group has been developing um, uh, tools and add-ons, a kind of wrapper that goes around um, the, the reachable set. So we've got codes on our, uh, on our GitHub uh, HTA reachability toolbox, including a more recent one, uh, which we call vehicles, uh, B is for Berkeley, but it's a, a level set toolbox using C++ and that, um, and that uses a, a, like a, a, a parallel processing paradigm for it to speed it up. So I'll say a few more words about computation, but, um, but there's a number of accessible codes that you can download, you can try out the examples, um, take out the example we have in there, plug in your own dynamics and, and try out this computation. Um, I think I've said all of this. So basically we have some, we have some advantage of using a level set formulation in that the set is represented implicitly through this, this function J of X T, but the boundary is the zero level set. Um, the magnitude of J, if we use a sine distance function to represent that initial j of x at time zero, um, then, and we're evolving back this sine distance function, then the magnitude of j represents the distance at any x represents the distance from that state to the boundary at any point in time. And that can be useful for control. Um, and then uh, j is negative inside and positive outside. Okay, so this is a this is an early example we did. These are four quad rotor aircraft. These are actually aircraft that we built ourselves. So you can tell it's an old video because it's not one of these new fancy uh, quad rotors that you can buy. But there's um, four quad rotors, four students. They're flying the each is flying the quad rotor around using a joystick. But there's an autopilot. The reachable set is encoded in an autopilot on board each of those aircraft. And when, let's just look at a snapshot on the right hand side. Um, so around each aircraft, you see three sets. So each one has three sets. Those are the three, each is a, is a reachable set with respect to each of the other three aircraft. And so when one aircraft comes, uh, they, or when a pair of aircraft, move in such a way that one of the aircraft gets onto the boundary of the reachable set of the first aircraft, the aircraft at the, at the center of that disk, the first aircraft will apply the optimal control. So it will move away from um, that aircraft that's coming within that, that distance um, until the aircraft is off the boundary. And the existence of that control, the ability for the, that aircraft to do that is guaranteed by the computation of the reachable set. So in this case, you can, because it's um, uh, these, these quad rotors, they can basically hover in place. You can prove that the reachable set of an aircraft with respect to all three of the other aircraft is just the union of the three individual pairwise reachable sets. That's not always the case, but in this, um, this case where the, the aircraft can hover, um, you can decouple it that way. And we, this was kind of a fun example because the students were sitting there, they were trying to collide with each other. And so as the aircraft came close together, 
the autopilot would take over and guide them away. So it was like this sort of invisible force field guiding the aircraft away from each other. Uh, you can also use this idea of a reachable set, a backwards reachable set for that opposite problem, for the capture problem. So here, um, the, the set that we're trying to, the set that we're interested in is a desired set. And we're interested in computing all of those states for which, for all possible disturbances, a control could guide the system into that desired set. So the, the formulation is the same except the min and the max have changed places. The control is now trying to minimize the inner product between the gradient and the dynamics, whereas the disturbance is trying to maximize, it's trying to, again, we don't know what it's gonna do, so we're assuming it's trying to keep the, keep the system outside of that desired set. So make that, uh, if we, we can think sort of geometrically about making the angle between the gradient and the vector field uh, as as small as possible, maximizing, or sorry, as large as possible, maximizing that. Uh, let's talk for a few minutes about computation. So solving a PDE is, it's like typically the challenge there is once you formulated it, it's, it's computing that. And again, we're doing this computation. If we grid up the state space, we're doing that computation at every grid point. And it's, um, it's computing a, a time derivative and a spatial derivative of J. So spatial derivative requires um, in, in its numerical implementation, depending on the order of the scheme, basically computing the, the value of J at all neighboring points, you know, and we're doing that at every grid point. So with our, um, as, as you increase the dimension of the state space, the, um, the, the number of grid points increases um, with respect to each axis you add onto your state space dimension. So the computation becomes exponential in the dimension of the continuous state, um, whether, it's a, whether it's a discrete time or continuous times. Um, so this is a common problem in all model checking methods. Um, somewhere another computation comes in. And over the years, there's been um, a number of uh, works to address this computational complexity. And it, they, they range from imposing, like looking at the practical problem you, you want to solve. Maybe it's a collision avoidance scheme, like the example that we just showed. And so, you know, how do we solve that? I mean, in, in real life, we solve that by putting protocols, right? We add, um, we, we have roads or highways in the air. We have uh, airways. So the, you're basically restricting the number of interactions um, that vehicles can have with each other so that, you know, for a four vehicle problem, if you had to consider concatenate all the states of those vehicles, you know, it gets larger and larger. So unless you can decouple it, like we could in that quadrotor example, um, you're, you're dealing with a problem that, that's, um, you know, very challenging to solve computationally. So we try to put in some protocols practically so that you can, you know, practically decouple the system dynamics. So you've only got, you know, each car only has an interaction with the car in front for, or car in front and to the side. Um, mathematically, people have worked on approximations. Um, and so we've also contributed to this. Um, instead of thinking about, you know, just any kind of dynamics, what about just linear or piecewise linear dynamics? Instead of using a level set representation, people have thought about what if we only allow um, certain um, kind of shapes in terms of our sets, like ellipsoidal or polyhedral sets. Can we get some computational gains there? Um, also looking at the mathematical structure, if the, if the dynamics of the system itself are monotone or they can be represented with linear temporal logic, we could get some computational savings there. Um, we've worked on decompositions, not just like the practical kind of decompositions with like roads and highways, but mathematically. How might you take a high dimensional differential equation uh, representing the dynamics and project it onto subspaces of the state space? Do the computation in the individual subspaces and then, um, and then the, use that to compute an over approximation of the whole reachable set. Um, we've also, and actually I'm going to just say a few words now about a few of these. There, there are some more recent work that I wanted to share. Um, how might we exploit offline computation? 
So even though it takes a long time, do some of these computations offline and then use them in real time. Um, and then um, and sort of segueing into our learning component, how might we use machine learning to, um, to compute these states and all uh, sets? And I'll say a few words about that before we move on. Okay, and um, I should have said this earlier, but please, um, if you have a question, I think there's time for questions at the end, but you also can just interrupt and uh, ask a question through chat or, or um, unmute yourself and ask a question. I'm happy to do, answer any questions you have. Uh, okay, so um, let's, let's just spend a few minutes now talking about computation. Um, I think it's especially interesting to this community thinking about embedded systems and how we might kind of truncate, like do real time effective computation, even if it's approximate in a guaranteed period of time so that you can use it in real time. Uh, so this is, a, this is a method which we call fast track for fast and safe tracking. Um, and the idea is to use reachability in robotic planning. So in collision avoidance and maneuvering around obstacles. And so the, the, the three columns here kind of represent three different paradigms. Uh, on this left-hand column, it's kind of what we've done in control theory for path planning and collision avoidance up to now. And I call it slow and accurate because typically we're using, you know, an, a dynamic model of our of our robotic system, you know, we want to capture the the, the, the both the, the motion as well as the angular motion of the vehicle. In this case, of this quad rotor, and then we plan the trajectory through obstacles using optimal control in a constrained field. So we can do that. Um, we get guarantees on safety as long as the model, you know, as long as the assumptions about the model are correct. Um, we can handle external disturbances, like I just told you about. But typically, you know, if we're using, say, a 12-dimensional model of this quad rotor, which is a fairly realistic model, it's slow to compute because you have this high-dimensional state space. Um, uh, by contrast, on the right-hand column is um, maybe a paradigm that's used a lot more in robot motion planning, which is very fast planning, but it's it's less accurate. So here, the the blue dotted line or dashed line represents a path that could come out of a, a motion planning scheme like um, like, a, like, a, um, like a fast marching method or um, RRT, these um, rapidly evolving random trees. So the idea is to approximate the, the robot itself with a very simple dynamics, maybe just a point mass model, which is represented by that black dot, a point mass model, and then plan very quickly by looking at like a number of um, possible waypoints that that vehicle could go through, maybe these, these sort of intersections here, and then connect them with simple paths, like straight line paths. So again, that's a very simple path. You can, you can quickly generate conflict-free paths in that they don't avoid the obstacles. But then when you want to track it, you know, you follow this uh, whatever, but uh, you, you try to track that and you're not guaranteed because you're not being you're not guaranteed to track the plan because that plan was not created with the dynamics of the vehicle and so it may be unsafe in that the the tracker the actual trajectory the robotic the system follows may deviate from the plan so the proposal for using reachability is to pre-compute a tracking error bound between the simple model and the more complex model so we create a relative dynamics between the high dimensional or typically high dimensional robot dynamics and the point mass model that's typically used in fast, in fast planning and robotic systems. And then with that relative model, we compute or pre-compute a tracking error bound. So that, what is that tracking error bound? It says that, you know, if we put the, the, the um, point mass model here at this dot, then pre-computing a tracking error bound means computing all states for which there's a control input of that high dimensional dynamic system, which will keep the, um, the, the high dimensional vehicle, the high dimensional model within that bound of the low dimensional model. And if you've pre-computed that, then you can just use that point mass and its tracking error bound and carry that tracking error bound around with you and do fast planning with it. So it's it's like a, a principled way of computing the kinds of buffers that people use in the in robotic motion planning anyway. 
And, um, and the, the cool thing is that, you know, you can use reachability to compute this tracking error bound. You can compute it ahead of time, and then you can use it with a variety of path or trajectory planners. So, um, so this is this principle illustrated um, with a, this is a projection of a four dimensional model that's trying to track a two dimensional model. So it's not that high dimension, but the, the idea is that we, we use reachability to compute this tracking error bound by pre-specifying a value function, which um, at um, you know, each, each level curve of this value function represents say a desired distance. So if we go back to the previous slide and represent that um, this distance here as a desired distance we'd like to stay within, so we can represent you know, a whole bunch of desired distances. And then the, um, you know, for example, this blue or the pink or the red desired distance. And then we can use reachability on the relative model between that four dimensional and two dimensional model and compute the set of states which is guaranteed to stay within those individual desired distances. So it's a reachability problem where instead of saying outside of a set, we're trying to stay inside of a set. So we're computing the controlled invariant subset of each of those regions. And the cool thing is that the reachability can be done on, the, on all of those sets at any given time just by performing reachable set computation on the function. So what we're showing here are these individual slices and what this means as this uh, computation um, converges here is that if you'd like to stay, for example, 0.5 meters away from, if you'd like the tracking model to stay 0.5 meters away from the planning model, you can't. There's no subset of that, um, that smaller 0.5 meter disk, which, uh, which stays controlled invariant. But as you increase your bound to say 0.75 or one meter, there is actually some volume in that reachable set. Meaning that if the tracking model stays within this kind of purple slice of um, this overall set, then it's guaranteed to stay within the purple slice using the control input we have available. And then there's more volume uh, here in the, the one meter set. And these shapes just come from the dynamics. It's a you know, the, the four dimensional model is basically a Dubin's car with acceleration, so it can turn either way. So you see that sort of symmetry here around the turning angle, turning that way or turning that way to stay, you know, within that set. <clears throat> so the smallest invariant level set becomes the tracking error bound. Okay, so we've applied this and I thought I'd show you a recent example of us applying this in a robotic scenario. And I see there's a chat question, which is, are the positions of the obstacles known beforehand? That's a good question from Sumit. In this example, we're assuming that those positions are known beforehand, and then we're going to relax that as we talk about incorporating perception. Let's see, is that the, yeah, okay, I've got the question. Uh, okay, let me just show you us applying this idea of um, fast and safe uh, tracking, fast track, to uh, an example of a person moving around um, and a robot, this quad rotor here, trying to plan a trajectory in the presence of this now moving obstacle. So um, this is relevant for the previous question, are, these, uh, are the positions known ahead of time? Here we're assuming that we know the position of the human. We can, you know, we can, we have some sensor that's giving us that position but we don't know what the person is going to do and that's what we want to model. And at the same time, we want to plan a path for the robot to avoid the person. So here in this work, this is a um, work by a, a couple of my students. It was joint with, um, with Professor Anka Dragan, who's a professor working on human, um, human machine interaction at Berkeley. Um, we used a Boltzmann model to represent the um, to try to capture the next few possible positions or configurations of the person or people in the field. And so um, this is represented pictorially here. We have a person, we assume there are some known goals for the person or people in the environment. And this picture here, the door is a known goal, will represent the goals by this variable theta, which appears here. Um, and then what this, uh, this 
uh, distribution is capturing. It's the probability of the human's action, basically what the human's going to do, which way in this case they're going to move, is represented. It's a, a function of the, the state, um, as well as, you know, the goals and, and some parameter which we're going to learn. Um, but that basically that the person of that sorry, the probability of that person's actions is, um, uh, is, is proportional to a exponential of a value function, this function Q, which uh, represents the kind of efficiency of that action towards achieving the goal. So this function here is a, it's, this is the uh, Boltzmann model. It's actually a Boltzmann model from physics where beta here represents the inverse temperature coefficient, but it's representing these regions of low probability or high probability of the person being in the next few time steps based on the efficiency of those actions towards achieving the goal. In this case, the goal of uh, getting to the door. So a straight line path is going to be represented as more probable um, as opposed to, you know, regions away from the door, like moving towards the door itself. So this is a model that was proposed in, um, in kind of the, you know, uh, rational uh, choice models in, in psychology, but it's been used a lot recently in, in robot motion planning. So we use this um, model in conjunction with fast track. And so here's, um, this is uh, Jaime, and Sylvia. They have both recently graduated from the group. Jaime is now at Princeton and Sylvia is at UCSD. And there's two quad rotors. And so Jaime and Sylvia, so here's Sylvia and here's Jaime from a top-down view. They're trying to move across the room. They each have a different goal. Sylvia is moving towards the, the door. Jaime is moving over here to the other side of the lab. And the quad rotors have to plan paths. They're also trying to move across the room. So what happens when you um, apply this Boltzmann model? Um, so these are the, the kind of high probability regions in the Boltzmann model, you see the colors. Um, the quad rotors are planning their paths using those high probability regions as obstacles representing where Jaime and Sylvia will be. And so let me just play that again. Um, Jaime was moving in a kind of maybe slightly irrational way. Um, he's, his, his region is a little more wide than Sylvia's. He's kind of dancing. They approach each other and then they're, they stop. So the, you know, the model itself doesn't capture the fact that they're stopping, but it does capture the fact that they're becoming a little you know, irrational. They're moving away from their desired goals when they stop. Um, so what we've done here is we've taken that, that inverse temperature coefficient beta and as we're observing the motions of Jaime and Sylvia, we're updating uh, beta just using a Bayesian update. So we're asking, is it, are they acting rationally towards the goal or irrationally? And then we update the, the beta coefficient depending on that. That's updated in real time. So it's a very simple learning problem, just a Bayesian update on that parameter beta, which allows the obstacles representing Sylvia and Jaime to either grow or shrink depending on how efficient they are towards the goals. And remember, this is always just a model. We're presuming what their goals are and we're asking you know, whether or not our model is efficiently representing them as they move. And then the quad rotors move around using fast track. So they're always computing um, the, their paths using a tracking error bound, which is, um, which is pre-computed. And then as that tracking error bound intersects the obstacles, they have to replan. Okay. Um, I'm gonna say one more word about computation, which is um, moving into our machine learning, integration of machine learning. So uh, computing this Hamilton-Jacobi function for reachability, um, uh, like basically most of what we've done so far in doing that has been, regardless of whether we use approximations or fast track, pre-computation, whatever, we're using a grid-based method to solve it. We're solving that PDE at, at each grid point, as I said earlier. Um, and one of the ideas of using deep learning here is to move away from a grid-based computation. So the idea is, could we take that, you know, the mathematical equation we want to solve over the space and time 
and represent that that the value function for a um, a, a deep learning based scheme um, represent that value as a neural network. So basically, try to learn a parameterized appro approximation of the value function using a neural network. So typically, you know, and, and so we're using theta here to represent the fact that here, let me get my pointer. So V of theta represents an approximation of the value function using a neural network where theta is now the, rep the, the representation of the parameters of that neural network. So typically, the neural network parameters are obtained by supervised learning, where the value function is assumed to be known at some states. But you know, here even that is a high um, that that you know that takes a lot of computation. So what we've been working on, and this is a, a recent paper with Samuel Bonsal, also a recent graduate of our group, he's now at USC, is to is to develop a computation scheme where using this, um, we'll call it the, the PDE violation error as the loss function for the neural network, we're, um, we're using a self-supervised scheme where we use the PDE itself as the source of supervision, but we find the optimal neural network parameters by minimizing this, um, this PDE violation error. And instead of um, uh, supervised learning, where we would have to, you know, actually compute some of these value functions at, at certain points, we um, the key idea here is to find the optimal neural network parameters through um, training, randomly sampling some states, like you know these uh, x i at time t i, and then you update those parameters to minimize the violation error. So you no longer need in this kind of self-supervised loop a uh, value function at the particular samples. And that's really the key to scaling to high dimension. So, um, so the, there's, there's a number of details here which are interesting, namely that PDE violation error depends on gradients. And so we have to compute the, you know, the gradient with respect to time and the gradient with respect to space, we, as we talked about earlier. Um, so it becomes really important what kind of neural network you use. And for example, a ReLU, if we look at the gradients of those ReLUs, we get these discontinuities. So it leads to errors when trying to represent the, um, the value function gradients. So the key thing that Sonmiel did was to use a fairly recent paper of, uh, called sinusoidal neural networks, which came out of the vision community. And they're effective at representing both the underlying function as well as the gradients. So we can get, you know, the, the, the gradients of, of these sinusoids are also smooth, and we can also obtain a safe controller for this. So I wanted to mention this because I think this is, you know, one of the re one of the kind of areas having um, you know, you have a, a mathematical equation that you you know what the mathematical equation is that you want to solve. We have the representation of that just solving it is a is a very challenging problem numerically. So you're basically training the neural network to solve this, but you you're you're giving it what you you know you're giving it the violation error through the PDE itself, but it determines where it does that computation. That's what the training, you know, the the, the training of this um, helps to figure out where the best points are to actually do that computation. And so the loss function contains the PDE, it contains the initial data, so that initial set, the G at time zero that we started with. And, um, and so we found that using this idea of curriculum training, where you spend um, the, a set of first training cycles <coughs> learning the, um, the value function to represent the initial data, and then on top of that, you uh, spend the remaining cycles learning the PDE itself seems to work well. So we've, we've got an initial publication on this um, and we're, we've been able to compute directly, uh, it's an approximation, right, V of theta, but higher dimensional problems than we've ever been able to compute before. So this is a nine dimensional, uh, it's a three aircraft collision avoidance problem with one pursuer and two evaders um, that we've computed directly using deep reach, deep reach is the deep, reachability tool using this neural network. And, um, and, and so when we compute the, 
the set itself, we've compared it with kind of that um, decoupled, uh, like the, the method we used for the quad rotor example that I showed you earlier, which doesn't work here because these aircraft can't hover. They're, they're models of aircraft. They're, they're basically conventional aircraft. So this blue region here represents the reachable set if you computed the three pairwise um, collision avoidance sets and you um, took the union of them. Whereas the pink region, including that blue region, represents the solution via uh, deep reach. And so you can show that, you know, there's regions that are outside the blue and inside the pink that lead to unsafe conditions like this here, you violate the minimum distance. Whereas if you look just outside the pink, you see that you maintain safety. So again, it's a numerical approximation. We've done these kinds of evaluations on high dimensional examples, and it seems to be computing better solutions than we've, uh, we've ever been able to compute for high dimensional systems. We just haven't been able to you know, go up to that dimension. So this is nine dimensions. This is a 10 dimensional example. It's a two vehicle. Each vehicle is five dimensions. And uh, one vehicle has to avoid a blockage in the road. So we have to compute the you know, optimal solution for both vehicles. And depending on you know, what you assume about the motions of the vehicles and their initial conditions, that you know, deep reach um, will give you the, you know, the optimal solution for those initial conditions. Um, we've now worked out a 16 dimensional system and we're working on a, a 22 dimensional walking robot right now with my colleague Koshal Srinath who works on um, uh, walking robots at Berkeley. Um, so this is, uh, I think this, this idea of using deep learning as a method for solving, um, like for doing scientific computation is something that's very exciting. Okay, let's spend the last few minutes. We have five minutes left. And that's um, to, to introduce, you know, we've had this segue now into using machine learning for doing the computation of reachable sets. So let's go into the last piece, which is how do we incorporate machine learning for things like perception now into robotic systems where we don't know the obstacles ahead of time. We're assuming that we're perceiving them with cameras or, you know, other sensors. And we'd like to be able to use deep learning, which is the paradigm now in, um, in computer vision for perception, um, but we'd like to incorporate that safely into the, into the robotic controls. So we started out a while ago, uh, this was from a few years ago, by just trying out you know, this kind of simple, well, not simple, but this experiment where we had a a robotic system, so this is just a, an aircraft, the, one of our quad rotors, that we wanted to um, follow a step trajectory in this room. So basically go up and down and up and down. Um, but we computed an envelope, uh, an envelope which um, is basically specified that, uh, a, a, or a reachable set from an envelope, which specified that we didn't want it to get too close to the ceiling or too close to the floor. Um, so we did that with the model of the quad rotor, and then we took the model away and we asked it to learn a controller that would follow this step trajectory, um, but without a model. Um, but we left it its reachable set. So it was allowed to keep its notion of a reachable set and moreover, what control to apply if it came up to the boundaries of the reachable set. Otherwise it had to learn a model and learn a control scheme to follow this step trajectory. So it first drops down because it doesn't have a model of itself, but it doesn't hit the ground because it has the bottom of its um, reachable set. And that gives it what control lot to apply to stay away from the ground. So we used a very simple learning scheme, policy gradient sign derivative. And after about a minute, it learns this, it effectively learns the control, the green and red trajectory to track the, blue dashed line. The red indicates where it's you know, coming down and using the safety controller so it doesn't violate the floor of that envelope, green, red, green. So this is, um, it's kind of a forced example because we used the model to compute the envelope and then we took the model away. But the idea is you can, um, whether or not you can use this safety-based control um, in conjunction with a learning scheme. So the safety-based control is you know, filtering away any learning-based 
uh, control that's going to, um, any action that was a result of the learning scheme that's going to drive the system to unsafe. So that, that gave us the first step to start thinking about, okay, but, you know, in real life, we'd like to, you know, as we learn, we'd like to incorporate the learned information into the model. And that's really what the, the, we've been doing more recently is to, is to go back to this idea of, you know, as you learn more about the system dynamics, can you become less conservative in your reachable set? So, for example, you know, you may be using the, um, uh, the, the smallest candidate reachable set as your unsafe set. And then as you're, as you're flying along, you get some information, you're gathering data, you record a disturbance, which is, um, you know, it may not be conservative enough. You have a disturbance, which is telling you, oh, the reachable set that you'd computed um, is actually not conservative enough because this disturbance that we're recording at this point is larger than we expected when we computed that from the model. So you can expand the unsafe set. Um, and then over time, hopefully you can use that information that you're gathering to get a better model of the disturbance and contract that reachable set. So here's the quad rotor again. Um, and we put a fan in the room. So this fan puts a disturbance in the, the lower part of the room that wasn't pre-recorded in the model. Oops. And um, let's just play this, there we go. So now again, the quad rotor is following a step trajectory up and down. Here, this is a former student, Kene Akamatalu, who worked on this. He turned on the fan which introduced a large disturbance in the bottom part of the room. And you'll see basically two different quad rotors. We ran this experiment twice and we've superimposed the results. So the shaded out quad rotor is um, what we do if we don't update the reachable set. And the, the, the quad rotor that's not shaded out represents using a control which recognizes that there's a larger disturbance there than had been reported, and it contracts the reachable set, in this case, the controlled invariant set inside the envelope to one where um, the disturbance matches the disturbance that it used to compute the original set. Um, so that's, um, that's the idea of updating the boundaries of the reachable set based on the models that you're learning in real time. And our latest work has been to, um, so this is now work which is in conjunction with Jitendra Malik, who's a computer vision specialist at Berkeley, um, is to incorporate uh, sensors like cameras in real time, um, so perception algorithms in real time that gather information and use deep learning to um, uh, provide an input to a planning and control algorithm, which is operating um, in, in real time. Um, so we've taken the idea of a reachable set boundary and again, use that to, um, uh, in, in, a, in a similar way as I showed you just uh, previously, to um, um, uh, prune away control actions which um, push the system into a possible unsafe set. So let me illustrate that through the architecture that we're proposing. So this is a modular architecture with a perception module. And this is a, a perception module that's taking images from the robot as it's moving. Um, it's also taking you know, information about the goal, where we want the robot to go. And we're also assuming in this um, experiment that the inertials of the vehicle are known. So it's, it knows its, um, its information as well as its, you know, angular, here we've got the current linear and angular speed. Um, and the learning algorithm outputs a waypoint, which is the best learned waypoint um, towards the goal position. And this is fed into purely model-based planning and control schemes that are then that then go through a safety verifier using reachability to control the actual robot. So this, this closed loop contains uh, perception-based learning and then model-based planning and control and the safety verifier to prune away any action resulting from, say, a, an error in the perception algorithm. 
Um, the, the details of this perception module are interesting. I'm not gonna have time to talk about them, but we trained it purely in simulation using optimal control. So the perception module was trained with a model-based optimal control scheme. And in that sense, it's also self-supervised. So the data is generated and the control is generated purely using optimal control. So here, let me end with this video. Um, the robot is trying to get to a goal. Let's look at this top-down view. Um, it perceives, uh, so it, it, the perception algorithm would have kind of pushed it into the table here and this uh, had an error here, but the reachable set, which is being updated in real time with information from the perception sensors, guides the vehicle away from that obstacle and then effectively. Okay, so with that, I'd like to conclude the talk. Uh, we talked about safety from reachability analysis. Um, and then we talked about um, what that construct is. We talked about computation of the reachable set. And then we started talking about how to learn from new information. And, and here where I think this is a, you know, sort of challenging scenario in the community, how we, um, answer these questions of how to update the how to update the the safety reachable set using new information um, how do we do that what kinds of guarantees can we make when we're updating something like that in real time um, and how do we apply that in unstructured environments um, so you know, for example supervising learning using optimal control um, and then how do we you know sort of incorporate models of what's going on in the environment, like the Boltzmann models we used for human motion. How do we achieve high confidence in those models? So some of the work that we're doing along those lines are to use reachability to try to not only predict how systems are going to move, but also predict confidence in learning parameters of those um, models and how we you know, achieve, can, can we say something about what actions we need to take so that we can achieve a high confidence in these models? We've also been um, uh, taking that uh, work in unstructured environments and using models of people's motion to avoid not only you know, static obstacles, but also people moving. So with that, I'd like to conclude and thank everyone. I'd like to thank uh, the students and postdocs who've worked on this with me. A number of them have graduated, like I indicated, and, and gone off to other places. The students whose um, names are bolded are current students who are uh, working on the work that I present today. And I'd also like to thank our funding agencies. Um, we've been lucky to get some uh, really uh, great funding to work on this for a number of agencies and our collaborators at Google and also um, at Berkeley in areas like compassion. So thank you very much for, um, for listening and I'd be happy to take some more questions if there are some. Let's uh, take this chance to thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Tomlin uh, and uh, questions. Let's open the floor to the questions. Uh, okay, while the questions are pouring in, let me ask one question I had. Uh, so in your drone collision avoidance example, and in general for autonomous vehicles, uh, we know that if you don't take an action early enough, then you can get into a situation where you cannot avoid an accident, right? So there must be a time window or horizon for which you must have to do the reachability analysis in order to prove safety. I mean, of course, that increases the complexity of the, of the problem, as you noted. But is there a way to uh, find out how much time window is enough and that you don't need any more time window to ensure safety? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Avaral. And um, the way we've done that in the past is to compute, is basically to do the computation. So that set computes, it, it gives you the set um, for the time horizon over which you do the computation. So it captures that notion of 
if you don't um, act soon enough, you're not going to be safe. So all states that are in that region are exactly those states which say, if you don't act soon enough, you're going to come into collision. Um, you know, how, how to, to, to try to predict ahead of time whether or not a state is safe or unsafe requires to do that computation. But if there's a way to kind of do a meta-like computation, I think this is what you're asking. Is there a way to predict ahead of time whether or not that reachable set will just keep growing over time or whether it's going to um, conclude, like it, whether it's gonna just close off and not grow over time? Um, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I think that's an interesting question. Right now we, we test it by doing the computation itself. But this, um, this work that I just mentioned, um, let me go back one slide. This is work with Andrea Baichi. She's using reachability in this way that is not just based on computing reachable sets over the physical variables of motion in a model, for example, or the motion of the person. It's also, you know, one of the variables that she's using, like she's computing the reachable set over, are these parameters that are being learned over time. Like in this case, it's the, the she's, she's in this computation, which relates to a person, a robot moving in a, a field where a person is also moving. She's using the, um, the beta parameter. So that's the parameter of uh, that we're learning over time based on how confident we are in our model. So it's like a, it's kind of approaching this meta argument of can you use reachability on a set of variables that represent learning parameters themselves so you can assess things like how um, how much time do I need to be able to know what to do? So it's like learning reachability or using reachability on the learning parameters to say something about the progression of the learning scheme and how long you can expect to have to wait before you know what, um, you know, in this case, before you know whether the person's going to go to goal A or goal B. So your question is, um, it's not exactly this, but I think this idea of using reachability as a kind of meta reachability problem is something that would approach an answer to your question. There is one question uh, from Sumit Mandal, and he's asking that in the drone example, how the vertical space is calibrated, how does it detect collision with ground? Is there some sensor deployed? Uh, so the drone example, we had a couple and there's different sensors on board the, the different examples. So in the, in the four vehicle outdoor example that I showed at the very beginning, the earlier example, the vehicles are um, communicating with a ground station. So the sensing is all coming through like an inertial system on the ground. In the vehicles that we have um, deployed in the, um, in the lab, they've got um, uh, phase space or uh, Vicon sensors on them so that, that we're using an external sensor field to detect the, you know, where those vehicles are. And in the drones that we're um, using now and, and the, um, well, it's a, a We've taken the experiment on the, the ground robot and we're flying it on drones. So they're using onboard sensors. So the ground robot in those last experiments that I showed is using an onboard camera to detect what's going on. And those are the current, uh, in our current drone experiments, we're transitioning that onboard camera onto a larger drone that we have in our lab. So it's a mixture, but the first, in the first sets of experiments, the sensors have been off board. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's all thank uh, Professor Tomlin again for a wonderful keynote. It was thank very- Thank you very thankful. much. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, for the general audience, uh, after this, there are four parallel research paper tracks, the cases, codes, ISS, EM soft, and one special session. And these sessions start at eight. Uh, so until that, feel free to enjoy a network in Gather Town. We have created a whole virtual town for you. And actually, uh, 
uh, there are some nuances there. For example, if you go next to a water fountain, you can hear the water, right, one. And second is actually our uh, uh, conference venue is next to a beach. So this is my puzzle to you, find the beach. So let's all meet at the beach in our conference resort. Thank you.